It's been 22 days. 29. Day 33. It's day 40 since Hurricane Maria hit. I still don't have electricity. There's still people in need of food, water. It's been more than 50 days and uh, we're still fucked. Puerto Rico, as it was once known, it's no longer. Hurricane Maria swept through the U.S. territory on September 20th and led to the largest recorded blackout in U.S. history. By mid-October, they were in the midst of a humanitarian and economic crisis and on the brink of a possible health catastrophe. I turned to social media to see what was really happening on the island. That's when I got in touch with Fernando from Atjuntas, Steph in Guaynabo, and Jose Miguel from San Juan. I asked if I could virtually join them for four weeks in their journey to rebuild their lives and communities after Maria. By my fourth week trying to speak daily with them, that is, whenever they could get internet access or service, I thought Puerto Rico would somewhat be up and running. But man, was I wrong. Puerto Rico looks like a nuclear bomb hit the entire island and luckily just left us alive. And there's still people that don't have roofs over their head. There's still people that have no access to clean water. There's, I mean, I don't expect to have electricity in my home in the mountains till next year. Like, we took a lot of years backwards. It's been almost two months post-hurricane, and this is what we know. About 60% of 3.4 million U.S. citizens still don't have electricity on the island. Federal and local aid has not reached the people who need it most. Government figures regarding missing people and deaths have been misleading. One of the biggest challenges is the blackout. I couldn't imagine going a month without electricity, let alone more than 50 days. So I asked them to show us a typical day without power in each of their neighborhoods. Take a look. Obviously the fridge is no longer a thing. Uh, we do have some dry foods. This is basically how my mom's been able to cook. She has two cans, one grill. It takes forever, maybe an hour. What would be cooked in 10 or 15 minutes. Some of these solar lamps that we've been using. And we're used to the dark by now. Hi, Melissa. Here's the generator that I'm using to power the fridge and uh, like two, two fans and uh, charge my phone and my computer and stuff. I'm gonna put some gas in and uh, start it. I get like maybe 10 hours out of this thing. This is your typical night. You can only hear electric generators, mostly going up until five, five, six in the morning. If you're not able to afford an electric generator, you're doomed, you won't be able to sleep, you'll go crazy. That's another thing. Generators are really expensive. Normally they can range from $200 to $700. And that's not even counting the gas or diesel needed to keep them running. I know that a lot of people like have generators that spend a lot of fuel and a lot of money. I know of people that can spend like $40 on six to eight hours. Lack of communication is perhaps the biggest issue on the island. For example, agencies like FEMA have most of their information for victims online. We're talking about points of food and water distributions, hotline numbers, and applications for damages. The main issue is a lot of people in rural areas of the island don't have smartphones, access to internet, or even phone service. So pretty much since day one, everything has been communities organizing because even from the first week, uh, we realized that uh, FEMA and the government response was completely inadequate. It was inefficient. We are now on our way in Sector Palomo, letting the community know that tomorrow we're going to be bringing some groceries for the most affected people in the area. ¿Cuántos son ustedes aquí? Yo tengo cuatro nenes y mi esposa son cinco. Vivían aquí en una de estas casas. Sí, esa es la casa mía. Esta que está aquí. Sí. Que se perdió sí, básicamente todo. todo, ¿verdad? No, yo perdí todo. La casa completa. La hija mía hizo un cuartito ahí, el tío mío hizo otro cuartito allá. Y, no, y, eh. y en cuestión de ayuda del gobierno, o el municipio, o de FEMA, o... Nada todavía. For the first two weeks, there were thousands and thousands of supplies just waiting on the docks because there weren't enough truckers. The truck drivers got to San Juan and they're saying like, okay, give me the water, give me the food. 
give me all the materials we need for we could take it to the mountains. They would say, just write your name on a list and we'll get back to you. And the truck drivers were like, we have no phone service in the mountains. We haven't anything. How are you going to call us? Like, like the help gets to, to the plaza. plaza. There's, There's a, a lot, lot of people that don't have cars. cars. And by, by the time, time they find someone who can give them a ride to the place, there's, there's nothing left. We're, we're their territory, so they're responsible. Like, FEMA isn't a charity. We pay for FEMA with the taxes we pay on our housing. When Puerto Ricans realized that rescue agencies weren't getting supplies to those in need, specifically in mountainous and rural areas, civilians like Fernando, Jose Miguel, and Steph did it themselves. They documented their physical and emotional journey and sent footage to me whenever they could drive down to an area with service or internet. We're here in Sector Juncos of Barrio Garzas, which apparently no one has come to visit or offer any kind of help. So everyone we keep bumping into, we're giving them groceries. They say that we're the first people they've seen come here. This is how we are doing the distributions. A month, day 30 after Hurricane Maria, and this is the first time people have been receiving goods and water after this hurricane. Nobody has been able to come here. Gracias por esto, a nombre de mi esposa y el mío. Te damos las gracias porque aquí no ha aparecido nada de la alcaldía, nada de FEMA, ni gobierno, ni ninguna casa. Ustedes son los primeros que llegan aquí. Un, un mes después de María. Un mes después de María. Y buscando agua, no, lluvia. Una agua lluvia no estamos bañando. I'm on my way to pick, uh, I think like three people to go to Utuado, setting up the tents and the tables. There's food for a couple of hundred people here. After a few hours, we finally reached Sector Las Minas. There's a massive landslide, which has some families incommunicated, so we're gonna have to walk to take the groceries to them. And uh, I already got crazy stuck. Hola, hi. After miles of walking, Fernando reached this family, where the mother of this man suffers from breast cancer. After the hurricane hit, the mayor of Atuntas came by with the press and promised to send her medicines. They never arrived. Pero entonces el alcalde dijo que iba a traer la medicina. Digo mañana te mando una compra después de abajo con la prensa. Lo que pasa es que ha pasado un mes y no ha vuelto. We have portable water so they can grab for their their homes. We've got a little bit of the situation is really, really sad. A lot of people have lost their homes. A lot of old people that cannot move have diseases. We rescued some uh, direct TV satellites and we just pinched them and we made a fogata and we made a meal, a warm meal for over 50 people. So Steph, tell me, how did you feel going to these communities and not seeing any local or federal help get to these people? I feel uh, Hurricane Maria kind of like washed away all the, the blind covered we had and really put out all the lies and all of the bureaucracy the gov our government has. People are dying, people need help. As of now, the official hurricane related death count is 55. The unofficial could be up to 10 times more, according to the mayor of San Juan. In addition, BuzzFeed News reported that there's been more than 900 bodies cremated since the hurricane, after being classified as natural deaths. I guess they were trying to either, you know, downplay the crisis we're living in or kind of just fit into Trump's narrative that this wasn't this bad a situation. At the first few weeks, they just said 16 deaths. 16 people versus in the thousand. You can be very proud of all of your people. And we know that they weren't counting the deaths due to people that died in the hospitals because of lack of, of power, people who have died from diseases uh, who could otherwise be treatable, but maybe, you know, lack of transportation, accessibility, or electricity has made everything 
so much more complicated. We won't know how many of those were from really natural causes or what happened with them. You don't see the transparency in our government and it's gonna keep happening. I saw the same thing in my reporting. Numbers just didn't add up. The official Puerto Rico police list of missing people by mid-October was 109. But I kept seeing and reaching out to people on Facebook who were still looking for their loved ones, like the father of Gladys Estevez, Gabriel Estevez, from Añasco, Puerto Rico, the loved one of Davina Miranda, Amelia Miranda, from Bayamón. These names were not in the official list, so I called the Puerto Rico police offices in San Juan. I've been on hold for 40 minutes. Now they're contacting me to another department. And waited. And waited. 41 minutes. No response. One woman on Facebook even told me that she was terrified that her uncle had been part of the 911 bodies cremated. The conditions have become so unbearable that as many as 130,000 Puerto Ricans are migrating to the U.S. mainland. Most have arrived in Florida. We have, we have like our, our heart in our throats just by thinking that Puerto Ricans are leaving. And do you personally know anyone who has left the island? Of, uh, artist friends of mine have left. A lot of uh, family members of mine have left. He is harsh. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a forced exodus. So I know about 30 people that have left Puerto Rico indefinitely or maybe for the moment uh, until things calm down a bit here. Things are moving really, really slow. And uh, I don't blame like a lot of people that have decided to go because they lost it all. People's day-to-day -day life has been turned upside down. The most basic tasks have now become extremely complicated. Okay, so you see all these, this big line? This is uh, the line to go to the bank. My mission today is just something as simple as trying to get cash from the bank is gonna take a few hours. Let's go. Like, nothing is working, so we can't get money out tonight or today. It, uh... I was trying to get food for my fiance's mom. We went to Sam's because they told us they had ice there. When we tried to get in, the line was like all the way around just to get into the parking lot. I couldn't even get inside Sam's. Everything is a struggle. Getting gas in some places is a struggle. Getting water in some places is crazy. Jose Miguel is a single dad and gave us a glimpse of the difficulties of caring for a toddler in these chaotic times. This has been a challenge for me too. I, I, man, but my kid, man, I have to be the best father in the worst conditions. That's why he, he, he goes with me to the communities. I know for a lot of people, not young and old that have kids, it's been really, really a struggle because kids get hungry at the worst times. One reason for the shortages and the process being so slow is the Jones Act, a rule that was established in 1920 and is why foreign aid and supplies aren't allowed into Puerto Rico after a natural disaster like Maria. The Jones Act is pretty much this completely antiquated law that controls uh, shipping routes to Puerto Rico. So the only uh, shipments that are allowed to come here has to be from uh, entirely U.S. crew and U.S. shipping routes. Just so you, you have like a, uh, an idea, Tylenol, they made Tylenol here. They ship the Tylenol, Tylenol to the United States to pack it. And then they ship it back to us and sell it to us. So we're paying the export fee and the import fee. Plus we're paying the taxes. So it's crazy. Puerto Rico is a commonwealth or territory of the US, but not a state. So to be clear, Puerto Ricans are Americans, but they lack one basic right of citizenship, voting. I can't vote for the president. No one living in Puerto Rico can, but Puerto Ricans can go to war for the United States. We have a voice in Congress, but we don't have a vote. The way Trump came and completely disrespected our people, and I didn't choose him. I was, I'm not allowed to vote for him. I mean, even before addressing Puerto Rico, he was talking about the kneeling football players for a week while here we were facing a, a, a utter catastrophe. The home of Steph's dad was shattered by Maria. 
Steph was helping him through the FEMA online application process to get him reimbursed. He, the inspector came. The FEMA inspector? Yeah, the FEMA inspector, but it's not FEMA. It's another company subcontracted by FEMA. I tried to check up on the status. They told me that I couldn't check the status because it was made by another subcontracted company. I called this company, WSP. And she, they told me that they don't have anything on. Then I call FEMA back and they're like, no, I don't have anything on him. I'm just going to give him his $500, which is nothing because he lost everything. FEMA has extended their online application deadline for disaster relief for 120 days. I email them to ask how people without access to internet or electricity will fill out their applications, but got no response. Again, Puerto Rico's help in Puerto Rico. We have some uh, people that are going into communities with their laptops and with Wi-Fi appliances, and they're like helping other people like fill their applications. You need help, and if you can help, with whatever you can help, sharing a post or whatever. It's important for voices to rise up and be heard. We're not just uh, pawns or toys or, or consumers. We're people, we're humans, and we're, we're dealing with a lot of suffering.